Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joanne Knowlton Gabriel, and on behalf of the Darien Library, we welcome you to our program this afternoon New York National Historic Sites and the History They Tell with Alan Depre. Alan returns for part five of this eight part series to talk about Castle Clinton and the forts of New York Harbor. Located at the southern tip of Manhattan Island is the Battery Park area. Castle Clinton is essentially where New York City began. Built originally to prevent a British invasion in 1812, this fort is welcome to the public and is seen by millions of visitors to New York Harbor annually. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this possible and our collections available to the community. Our presenter this afternoon is a seasoned lecturer of programs about our national parks and historic locales for over 20 years, focusing on important issues of universal and American values. A retired United States park ranger, he has delivered speeches to American and international audiences about famous sites such as Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty, Grant's Tomb, and Federal Hall, to name a few. Please welcome Alan Dupre. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you very much. That's quite an introduction. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about some of the uh, forts in New York Harbor, basically Castle Clinton, which is right at the, uh, right at the battery uh, and right at the tip there, and uh, easy in access. And most people who go there, sometimes I'm sorry to say, though not for the Statue of Liberty's sake, uh, go there for tickets to go to the Statue of Liberty. Uh, there are uh, tours there, I've done them, uh, other rangers have, but it's not as heavy as a, what they call an interpretation site. It could be better. And I haven't, been, I haven't worked for the Park Service in four years now. I don't know how much has changed. Uh, uh, at this point, I have gone back a couple of times uh, the past four years. Anyway, we'll talk about that as we go along. In the meantime, though, the, the picture you're seeing on your screen is not, of course, a fort. That's the Grange. That's Alexander Hamilton's Grange. And for those who uh, were here last, last time and, and when, I, when I was doing the Grange, uh, I, I don't think I had a dramatic enough picture on how they moved it. Uh, so here, we, here, here it is, uh, as it's being moved up to its final location. I think that was done in 2006. Uh, and so I don't want to confuse anybody, uh, 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 but just about the forts of New York Harbor, sort of jumping back and forth a bit. Uh, this is an example of at least Castle Clinton of recycled history, and I'll explain more about that as uh, we go along. All right, here I did have a picture. Those those great piles there, they had to rise up the place, or uh, and then uh, put those uh, uh, grids across, and that's how they moved it or got it onto the structure that moved it along. Rather dramatic. And uh, that it's, I think it's the third time it's been moved. And this is the final one. Now, uh, you see, I'm going into Alexander Hamilton. And for those who were uh, there, as I said last, last week, uh, I got a question about uh, how did uh, Alexander Hamilton become an attorney and what, what was the training? So I found an article. And uh, uh, this is from the Marquette the University. A and uh, anyway, uh, it tells you that after uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton came back from the war, there was a, a, a veteran's exemption. And uh, so it uh, allowed, uh, or, and it was an exemption, excuse me, from the requirement that the attorneys had to complete an apprenticeship. So I, I was wrong about the apprenticeship business last week. Uh, he studied law on his own for six months. Uh, his, his main textbook was Lord William Blackstone's commentaries on English common law. And uh, he passed an oral bar examination in 1782 and became very a very successful lawyer. 
Now, in the 1780s, there were about 50 uh, attorneys in lower Manhattan, and his offices were towards the tip of Manhattan. He took an occasional criminal case, uh, but it was uh, a civil practice that proved uh, rewarding and lucrative. So uh, he was very talented and passionate in the courtroom. And according to his biographer, Ron Chernow, he had a, quote, melodious voice coupled with a hypnotic gaze, and he could work himself up to a towering passion that had listeners enthralled. So he had a lot of wealthy clients uh, inundating him. And of course, he, he had, he, uh, in the 1790s, he was the Secretary of Treasury of the Treasury of the United States. And when he left that, uh, he made his uh, main uh, living from being a lawyer. And he also tutored apprentices. And he, uh, so some of his sons became lawyers. Uh, so uh, there you go. And that was pretty much how the veterans could become a lawyer in New York and, and what you had to do uh, to be a successful one. So if there's questions about that, you could always ask at the end of the, uh, this, this presentation. Hassel Clinton, historical and practical recycling. <laughs> okay, I, I put this photograph in, and I, it's the late 1940s or early 1950s. I've seen it. I saw it when I was a kid, when I was, a, uh, I mean, since I was born in 1947. So I remember seeing this either in a magazine uh, or on a poster. And of course, that is lower Manhattan across the way. The uh, circular structure to the left uh, across the main body of the airplane is Castle Clinton. And uh, that's, uh, uh, pretty much a nice view of, of the battery and Castle Clinton. And just but what looks like it's just below the plane, and it's not, on the other island, which is Governor's Island, which is the, on the foreground towards us, you see on the left another circular structure, and that's Castle William. And then we see a star fort to the right, and that's Fort J. Uh, so those were the three main forts in New York Harbor, but there are quite a few more. And we'll talk about that as well. When we talk about things leading up to the War of 1812. A uh, photograph of Castle Clinton. Ah, this was taken in modern times. Uh, and uh, I don't know exactly when, uh, but this is what you would see still today as you walked up uh, to the fort from Battery Park. It, the walls are eight feet thick, I believe, and it's a sandstone. Uh, and that sandstone was, I don't know if they use the term mined in New Jersey. Uh, so that's where the stone comes from. And it's red, of course, and you will see that, a reddish color. And uh, here we have a excavation that was not done on this site, but it, a part of it was brought here and that's part of the bat battery in lower Manhattan, uh, probably uh, put there in the, at the end of the colonial times uh, uh, before the revolution. And here's another view of it. So we, we have a exhibit from an old battery wall, uh, most likely used for defense, as you could see. And that's in the right in the middle of Castle Clinton. Oh yeah, right behind uh, this gentleman with his arms uh, wide. I think that's my old supervisor. You see the bookshop, and right next to that bookshop, there had, uh, and of course, it wasn't there when it was a fort. There was a furnace, and that's where you got the hot shots from, uh, since you had twenty-eight cannons in the fort. Uh, it made it even uh, nicer for uh, uh, when you were defending the site to shoot off a very hot cannonball, which could uh, set uh, sails on fire or burn wood, etc. So that was that made it even a little more difficult when you had to load these cannons. Anyway, on below that picture in red is the Manhattan site's long-range interpretive plan. Each site in all the parks 
uh, that we that, of the Park Service, there's a plan that has to be set up on what you want to emphasize in interpretation, uh, looking into its historical significance, how you want to develop uh, 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 educational uh, programs for school groups, and also uh, obviously to tell the story to adults as well. So both are very important there. And uh, so this was a, a very interesting exhibit. Uh, one day, <laughs> one of the workmen, while they were doing some work here in the castle, got confused and he was supposed to be breaking up something and he started breaking, pounding on the wall. So that was a rather, with a hammer, that was a rather interesting, or sledgehammer or whatever, <laughs> which he had to be stopped almost immediately. I, I don't remember exactly why he got, con got confused or what he was doing specifically, but anyway. Uh, it's humorous and no damage was really done, but that's why you have to keep your eyes out open all the time. Okay, now we're going to leave Castle Clinton for a while and go on to Governor's Island. And to the left is the old ferry terminal that will take you there. It's right down the way a bit. Just You just follow uh, to the end of Battery Park, you keep on going and you'll come right to that. Uh, at, it's on the other side of the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. And it's uh, quite, a, quite a handsome structure. Uh, another uh, a picture of Battery Park, the harbor in Governor's Island. And uh, I don't quite see uh, Castle Clinton there. Hmm, that's interesting. Here is Fort J. This was the triangular, the star-shaped fort, excuse me, not triangular, star-shaped fort. And uh, this is the moat. You're crossing, you're walking over what, what, what would have been a bridge at one time and into the main gate, which would lead to the parade ground and the barracks, et cetera. And you see it right there in the grassy area. So this, if it had a moat, I, I don't even, I. Not quite sure. Uh, perhaps it wasn't necessary. An interesting thing about all these forts is they never fired in a war. Sometimes they practiced a bit shooting the cannons off, but uh, they were strictly really or wound up being strictly for defense. Basically, they are anyway. And, uh, and when the War of 1812 happened, uh, the British weren't going to bother to try to come in with their fleet because with, since there's so many forts around, uh, and there were more than these, there was a fort, Fort uh, uh, Bedloe, and there was a, a fort on what was now Ellis Island, that, and Bedloe, I believe, was on the, uh, Liberty Island, which was not called, called Liberty Island then. And, uh, and there was also another, a, a battery works, on Governor's Island as well. That probably would have had basic, basically made with reinforced earth, earthenware. And, uh, but the, these forts we're seeing are full blown forts, but they were never used in the War of 1812 or any other war. And by the Civil War, all the cannons on these uh, structures and the walls themselves would have been obsolete. I believe this is Fort J, and obviously you see the the uh, points of the of the uh, star, and you see that you could fire them off in succession, and you wouldn't be hitting uh, uh, the uh, next cannon next to you or anything else like that. Uh, so uh, same thing with the circular fort. So they were uh, a much better structure especially for harbor use. And this is Castle William. We had Fort J and now Castle William on Governor's Island. It's called Governor's Island because one of the British governors uh, owned the property and had a house there or a summer uh, a house in the 1700s. There's another view of it. Now that has over a hundred guns it was probably the, the most powerful fort or the, uh, shall we say, the one that really would have shot off a great deal of firepower. 
And so it was the best dressed for it, I guess you can use that term, in the early 1800s. And here's another view. And another. And I, I, I might have gone to town a bit, because I just think these sports are great to look at and the views are great to look at as well, looking off again across the harbor. Uh, there's another view on the other side. Now, this is the interior and all those windows there, it used, was used as a prison uh, during the Civil War. And also, uh, I think, I, I believe up into World War I. And uh, one of the gentlemen who was supposed to be there for being AOL, uh, absent without leave, a a a AOW, uh, was supposed to be Walt Disney. <laughs> so I believe that is true uh, for those who are interested in a little historical gossip. I guess his crime was not either, was not coming back on time or perhaps disappearing for a while. Something to look into anyway. And again, two views of Castle William. It's a great place to visit. And you could see some people look like they're enjoying their lunch. And uh, you could all you and any of these sites, uh, you just uh, need to Google, and uh, you, uh, you could say Governor's Island or, or Castle Clinton or Grant's Tomb, and you, you'll see very quickly. in one of the selections is the NPS sites and the uh, telephone numbers and the times uh, that they're open, and and you can even get the uh, boat schedules as well. So. Just be aware of that. Now, interestingly enough, I, I, I had a little trouble finding this, at least not photographs of it, uh, about this section coming up. And I guess uh, if anyone remembers in the uh, 1980s that uh, Re Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan met with Gorbachev uh, about uh, uh, Russian and American relations, and, uh, and which led to some disarmament. Uh, so here's a plaque commemorating it. And here they are with Vice President Bush and Ronald Reagan in the middle and Gorbachev there to, the, to the, my right. That's, I believe the building below, this was a military base for many years. And when I was at, uh, when it first opened, uh, I believe in the early 2005, 2006, uh, by the Park Service for tourists again and visitors. Uh, I, I believe this was the superintendent's uh, uh, house uh, on the island. There's quite some very nice structures uh, where the officers stayed, etc. cetera. Uh, now, a nice view of Fort J and the, tri tri uh, the Star Fort. Very popular that I believe that was uh, something that was uh, fine tuned by the French. They were great at building these forts. And uh, beyond uh, to the left, you see uh, ca uh, Castle William again. So Fort J in the foreground, Castle William uh, in, in the background there. Now back to Castle Clinton. Now Castle Clinton was supposed to have Originally, the idea was it was to have three tiers and have as many guns as Castle William. It never got beyond that. I believe its full uh, amount or allotment of guns were 28. And of course, this is the present time, nice view. And we're looking down on it. And uh, the two big circles there that you're seeing, those roofed areas, uh, to the left is the ticket office and to the right is the bookshop. But uh, a little to the left there of the uh, ticket office, you see a circular structure and there or, or in the middle there. And also to the right where you see which was is, has been used as a stage uh, by the park service, uh, you see a curb section there in between the two rectangular sections. And uh, so that uh, is a, a, a circular structure which they built around uh, this, uh, a stage for. Those were the covers for the cistern. Now, Castle Clinton was 
on an island, uh, a, a small island, rock formations and more ground uh, uh, was added to it to make the little island that Castle Clinton is on. And there was a drawbridge crossing from the mainland to the castle. And remember, uh, the tip of Manhattan, Manhattan has, uh, has extended in size because of land fill. Uh, so you will see views of Castle Clinton at when it was an island. And uh, the triangular structures on, either, on the roof on either side of the front there, I will talk about in a little bit. I'll bring that, this picture back up when we do talk about it. So the system, of course, when the drawbridge would be up, uh, then you'd get your water. Uh, and that was uh, to be filled by rainwater. So a little touch and go there, I guess. But anyway, they would be ready for siege if they had to. Well, they thought they'd be. Uh, the cast iron door, though, that is uh, like a veneer. It's a, a wooden door underneath. And these are, this is probably early in the morning. Many times when I went there to uh, open up, you'd have uh, some people already waiting to get in uh, for mostly for tickets, uh, 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 as I say. Very, uh, very big there at Castle Clinton. So about 5 million uh, visitors go to the Statue of Liberty a year, and most of them come through here. Some come from Liberty State Park on the Jersey side. And there is another view, get office, looking up at the nice, nice views of, uh, of the buildings in Manhattan. And uh, on the left was part of the officer's barracks where you see those windows. And there was the uh, commandant's uh, uh, office uh, beyond the, uh, a gift shop here that you're seeing. Here's some views of Castle Clinton in the winter. Uh, the crowds the, to the right, the upper right there, and you see the crowd, that is just probably forming. And those, those uh, crowds uh, would form lines uh, out the door, as a matter of fact, going around uh, uh, the building and sometimes way into Battery Park. One, one, one visitor asked, said to me once, I don't know if I, uh, how come you don't tell us that this is uh, so many people come here in the summertime, we've been waiting for hours. And I did say, well, they're want to go get tickets to the Statue of Liberty. And also not only is this a, a, a national site, it's also a world heritage site, at least the statue is. So that's why you get the huge crowds coming to the Statue of Liberty and coming through here uh, at the uh, and buy, get their tickets if they haven't done them online already uh, and buy their tickets here. Uh, some of the entertainment that's held here, um, uh, rock groups, uh, popular singers, etc. cetera, that's uh, entered and almost every sum summer, I guess before COVID, uh, there were quite a few events going on. Uh, especially concert-wise. And they were using that large stage that I showed you in the overview. And also Shakespeare. Every year uh, they do a, a couple of productions of Shakespeare from the New York Classical Theater. Uh, I don't know if this is exactly the Tempest, uh, but we'd have to work overtime uh, to uh, be there uh, to uh, make sure the building ran smoothly, and we did too. And so here you see a couple of the productions in Castle Clinton. And they're very popular, as a matter of fact. So look out for them. If, if once this COVID business is out of the way and in, oncom in this oncoming summer, I don't think they had them this last summer, but uh, hopefully they will again. Now, when you go into uh, what the old um, officer's barracks, this is the main exhibit area. Uh, and uh, those dioramas, they start with on the lower right, it's out of, out of um, sequence, of course, that would be how uh, Castle Clinton looked in the early 1800s. Uh, so there you see it's a full blown island. Uh, the one uh, 
next to the one, let's see, the upper left, I believe that's uh, around the 1940s and the uh, lower left, probably 1885. Uh, so uh, interesting place to take a look it's, it's worth a look when you when you if you do go go there and you just and you do are getting tickets for the statue of liberty okay here we have the peepholes there which uh, in the old days in medieval times you'd be shooting arrows through there etc or maybe throwing hot oil out below but of course this was a modern fort up up to date early 19th century and this is where uh they stuck the guns out and this, when you aim them, this had to be done by experienced uh, officers. And they used their eye to try to arrange it as much as possible in the direction it wanted to go. Rather difficult. Uh, here is a view of the interior again. And that is one of the, that is the cistern area that I was telling you about. Uh, in the to, off to the right, and the other one is on the other side where the stage is. Uh, where you see the windows, that is the museum, and that's where the officers' barracks were as well. A and uh, if you go down a little further, there was the uh, gunpowder room, uh, which I'll show you. I'll give, which I will give you an idea of what it looked like. Though I don't have any pictures of that area, uh, I just had to pick some that were very similar to what you would see there. Okay, now, uh, this is a 24-pounder. Uh, I don't think there's much difference between a 24-pounder and a 32-1 or what have you. Uh, but of course, there was quite a big recall, recoil on those when you shot them off. I think it took a couple of, uh, a couple of minutes to reload them. And that doesn't seem barely enough time with all you'd have to go through with it to do so. And here is a, what we say, a, a little model of one and some diagrams. And uh, keep that in mind. I couldn't get pictures uh, or diagrams that uh, showed the process, but I can tell you a bit about it. And uh, this is a 32 pounder, very similar. That's the ramrod right there. And uh, you have to put gunpowder in there. And then there has to be something they call the wad or wad or whatever. Wad is the word, I believe. And uh, that uh, it could be old rags. It could be uh, some, some kind of uh, uh, cardboard or, or cardboard substance. I don't think they had cardboard at the time. And, uh, and you see it's spaced between from the gunpowder, the powder charge, you see the cannonball, and then you see the ramrod there as well. The pricker, that's uh, what you're going to uh, light. Uh, it's more obvious in the uh, in the uh, in this one here, though. You, it's right up on the top. My finger was pointing. I think you could see that. And this is the process. Sponge your guns first thing. You use a wet sponge. You stick. You ram it in there and make sure there's no burning materials in there. Then you use the cloth bag that I was just talking about. They called it a cartridge here. And uh, you would uh, fill it with a, 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 a measured supply of gunpowder. Uh, so once you have that in, the, the cannonball was loaded and you had to have uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, protection area, the... Uh, wads uh, in between each of these uh, things, gunpowder, cannonball, and then the final discharge. And of course, they pre-measured the supply of gunpowder. So you'd have uh, measurements, little bags there of pre-measured gunpowder. Uh, so you wouldn't have to be measuring it all the time. So it would save time. Okay, prime your guns. You put a small amount of loose gunpowder poured down uh, the touch hole, and that, of course, where the few. Then, the, then you would do the fuse, and then fire. You spark with, from a match or flintlock, and you ignite the gunpowder, 
through this record over here. That's how it worked. It may be a little bit confusing. I hope not. I'm certainly not an armorer. And uh, I'm glad I'm not, that's for sure. Anyway, this would be the gunpowder room. This is where you would store the gunpowder in those barrels. Uh, this is not a, a, a picture of Castle Clinton's gunpowder room, but it's very similar. And it would have had an arched ceiling like the one you see below, uh, but of course, much higher than this. But I put that there to give you the idea. And uh, as uh, I had said before, I was gonna tell you about the triangles on the roof. And both of those triangles uh, would originally have covered the, a gunpowder room. There were two of them for storage. And of course, uh, this is highly inflammable. You had to be very careful. Uh, and if there was an explosion, uh, that area on the, was, uh, was much less structured. So the uh, explosion would blow up the charge of it would go up and out the walls because where you see the straight line across the walls below there were not as thick as the rest of the structure. So that means that the if there was an explosion, the force would go up and out and not within. So it was pretty clever. There's lots of clever things like that in, in some of these forts. Castle Clinton National Monument, ceded to New York in 1823, and it was renamed in 1824 Castle Garden. Now, what did they do uh, uh, with that space? The city of New York took it over. Uh, they didn't buy it. They sort of uh, rented it or what have you. I don't even think it went that much. It was just completely turned over to them because the uh, federal government believed it did not need uh, Castle Clinton anymore for war purposes. There were the other forts in New York Harbor. And, and uh, so it was unnecessary. So they wanted to do something with it. Now, at the time, the city fathers were saying maybe it should just be torn down. Uh, and that area, well, they hadn't decided what they were gonna use it for, but what to use the island for until someone came up with the bright idea of, no, we can use it. We could use it as an entertainment center or a place where people, the people of New York could go and promenade around. A promenade was put up on the, uh, uh, on the top of the wall. And uh, some of the things they did was, uh, they uh, had uh, a museum, they had entertainment, Castle Garden opens to the public in 1824 as a resort, theater, and restaurant, okay? And they also had a garden in there. And they uh, put the stairs to go up to the top of the walls and you could promenade around there. You could buy a book of tickets for $5 and you could rip off or pull off the tickets if you wanted to visit or go to some of these things that were going on. Now, $5 was quite a bit of money in those days. How many uh, working class people used it? I don't know, but a lot of the middle class in that area did. And uh, since uh, New York was much smaller, a lot of the upper crust lived in that area. So it wasn't very far to take a walk down to the uh, uh, Castle Clinton, but actually I'm jumping ahead of myself because the first thing it was used as was as a fort. And this is Ironside, old Ironside. And uh, the fort system in the early Republic was basically started in the 1790s. And uh, forts were built all along the coast, but most of them were not with thick walls. They were uh, uh, earthenware. Earthenware sometimes reinforced a bit with stones uh, and of course, cannon. And uh, so in, in an act of Congress in 1794, uh, monies were set aside for the uh, force to be built along the coast. And um, they usually, like I say, open works of earthen parapets 
eight to 10 guns to several dozen of these, and it depended on the size of the fort and its importance. Sometimes the earthen works were reinforced with timber and even stone. And most of the guns in the 1790s were, which were, were left by the British and or bought from the French and a lot of French engineers helped build some of these first forts. But when things got a little sticky during the French Revolution towards the end of the 1790s, uh, that wasn't done anymore with using the French engineers. So Americans uh, and the American army uh, started using uh, the um, local engineers who were being trained to be able to do uh, uh, some of this cannon air business. And uh, mostly 24 pounders. Uh, and uh, the, the guns were actually owned by states. So it was sort of a combination of the federal government and the states. Uh, so uh, as I say, mostly French engineers were built them and planned them with the approval of the state governors and the federal government. Uh, but as I said, that began to end when the French Revolution uh, caused some problems between the young United States and, uh, and France. In 1798, Congress set aside $250,000 to restore and complete existing works and a small amount of new ones. Uh, now, was that for the whole country or was that just for New York? It might have been for the whole country, hard to believe. Uh, and then this thing of reinforcing and building forts flux, fluctuated. Uh, sometimes things were hot, uh, be, uh, worrying about the British and the French. And as the Napoleonic Wars came along, uh, uh, there was going to be a lot more money set aside to build these forts. But even when there were peace treaties between the British and the French, if that happened, then the, the funds uh, would sort of dry up a bit. So anyway, uh, the early American Republic was much involved in international affairs. Uh, it was, um, they were warned by George Washington not to make uh, alliances, uh, permanent alliances with the Europeans, stay out of the, as much as you can, the European affairs, but they couldn't because there was a war world, there was to be a world war going on between France and the continental system and Great Britain. And so remember uh, the British had colonies in India and the West Indies. Uh, the French Navy uh, was powerful for a time, but then it was destroyed for the most part at Trafalgar. And uh, so the, the French were pretty much into their, the continent. And the British of course blockaded them wanted to not exactly starve them to death, but to keep trade going uh, uh, and helping them out. And, and so uh, this be, was a big deal. And the British were impressing American sailors. Uh, they stopped American shipping and would literally take those sailors off who they believed were English. And there was no such thing as naturalization according to the British. Once a uh, Englishman, always an Englishman. So they use that to, uh, as a rationale for impressment because a lot of <laughs> sailors didn't want to be on British ships at all. So it was quite a troublesome time. And uh, as uh, things happen, this is the old Ironsides again, which is still in existence. Uh, I believe that's a frigate. And uh, this was uh, during the War of 1812. Uh, I believe that is the uh, th that is a, uh, a et etching or or a lithograph of uh, the con the Constitution. I mean the old Ironsides. And uh, here we go. And of course he was was commanded by. Even Decatur, and that uh, was the British ship Macedonian, October 30th, 1812. That's obviously uh, when the war had begun. And of course, that war of 1812 with the burning of Washington, 
And now all of this uh, got New Yorkers very much upset. And, uh, and uh, during the first decade of the 19th century, the federal government set aside $3 million. And that I know specifically was for all the coastal defenses. So they built many forts. Uh, I believe Fort Sumter might've been one of them. Uh, and many were in New York and the people of New York were always worried about a British invasion. Remember uh, there was the embargo and then Jefferson and Madison uh, uh, forbade uh, any trade with uh, uh, Britain and France, or if one would stop impressing the, so the sailors or uh, uh, stopping American ships, then they would trade with them, that country and, and not the other. It never worked out very well. And there were quite a few recessions and depressions and New York suffered greatly. But since they had been invaded during the American Revolution, and that certainly was in their memory that had only been uh, a, few, no, uh, a few, few decades before, but still within memory of many people. Uh, if they weren't there, they certainly heard about it. So they were afraid of another invasion. And those big forts, Castle Clinton, Fort J, uh, uh, Castle William, uh, were uh, part of that rearmament of the $3 million, which were, I believe, a, a, a federal appropriation in 1806. And so hopefully uh, they would be ready for any war and it did come in 1812. Uh, we, I'm not going in depth obviously with the uh, war of 1812, but this is the Treaty of Ghent which almost as soon as the war began, they started talking about peace and the treaty just returned everything to the same situation as before the eight war of 1812. The only thing is Napoleon was gone and the, the world war was over. So there wouldn't be much of a need to impress uh, uh, American sailors to uh, serve on British warships. Uh, I believe this is from 1912. And uh, this is a, a celebration of the uh, end of uh, the War of 1812. So that would be 1815. And uh, interestingly enough, in Niagara Falls, Ontario, we have a uh, sand sculpture commemorating 200 years of peace between the United States and Canada, because we were at war with Canada, obviously part of the British Empire and 200 years of peace with Great Britain. So uh, that's quite a state of affairs. And it's one of the larger border, largest borders that have no defense works on them. Uh, so that peace certainly has held. Okay, now this is Castle Clinton when it became an entertainment center. And uh, you see it's roofed here. So this would be after 1844, because not only was a roof put on, I believe in the 1820s, but by 1844, uh, the landfill had, no, uh, had made it so that the Castle Clinton was no longer a, uh, an island. And so here we have some people enjoying themselves there and uh, view of the battery circa 1820. And uh, uh, as I say, the uh, uh, people would come down, uh, especially the middle-class people who lived in that area and the wealthy merchants, et cetera. So it was a popular place to visit. Now that uh, the, the Castle Clinton, as I said, uh, it was renamed, I didn't say that, it was renamed uh, a Castle Garden. And so uh, when a roof was put on it, that was to make it even a different situation because it was gonna become an in interior theater. It doesn't show you in this picture on, uh, of, the, uh, of the fort, but bathhouses were put on either side of them. And so you could uh, take a dip from there as well with all the paraphernalia or whatever they used when they did do that, pretty much a protected area. 
uh, from, uh, I guess, uh, keep you from prying eyes, but uh, entertainment, uh, uh, two bathhouses on the uh, 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 um, uh, left and right of, of the structure, and also gardens and uh, and uh, demonstrations of uh, uh, things that were, shall we say, up and coming in the new world of technology. And uh, that was all of this happened between 1824 and 55. And after 1845, it became it a theater. And on the right, you can see structure that was placed on the walls and, and the walking area, the promenade area above that. And those I believe are the two bath houses left and right on either side of the door, right? both of those pictures. Okay, so one of the things that uh, a gentleman called Orsted, uh, the discovery of the magnetic field that sur surrounds an electric current. So, he uh, had a demonstration there, and also he petitioned for a telegraph room in Castle Clinton. Louis Kossuth was uh, one of the revolutionaries of the 1848 Hungarian Revolution, and he came to the United States and spoke at Castle Clinton as well. Now, in 1824, a big deal when the Marquis de Lafayette came back to visit. The Frenchman who had was who was a great favorite of George Washington, and also used his fortune uh, to help the Americans and also to actually uh, be a combatant in uh, the American Revolution. So he came back to visit in 1824 at uh, under with huge re, huge crowds greeting him, and uh, uh, then taking a tour of the United States. Then there was a balloon ascension. <laughs> it says snagged, which happened to be snagged by Castle Gardens, um, uh, a flagpole, which is rather interesting. And he almost lost his life. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. But anyway, the next month he tried it again and it worked. There's Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, there's his death mask, as a matter of fact. Uh, the difference between a young man and a very old one. And his landing in New York City with the harbor just filled with boats greeting him. And uh, I believe this was the same. No, not quite. This I, I, I don't remember what this one was. OK, some commemor commemorative objects, uh, a plate. And you see a uh, picture of the Castle Clinton on there as well. And again, my goodness, how fast the time goes. It's really getting late. Uh, Andrew Jackson came to visit, 1833. Uh, uh, Samuel Morse uh, demonstrated the telegraph in 1842. Uh, and uh, the big deal came, uh, one of the biggest events, September 11th, 1850, when the Swedish Nightingale, and this, of course, when it was a theater now, so by 1850, it was completely used as a theater. And Jenny Lind had her American debut where more than 6,000 people paid $3 a seat at least, which was quite a bit of money. Um, you had to be fairly well off to do that or at least to have that extra money to do it. And at the close of her performance, the audience broke into a tempest of cheers. She then went on tour and made thousands of dollars. And of course, the entrepreneur, the, the empresario who brought her here uh, was P.T. Barnum, gentleman from Bridgeport and also from the circus fame. And he made a couple of hundred thousand dollars, I believe, off of her tour. And she made about $20,000. So it was quite a big event, well advertised. Uh, and she was very popular. Here she is. September 11th, Swedish Nightingale. And they all came to hear the Sweet Warbler sing. Uh, and that concert brought in $26,238. And Jenny Lynn got 10,000. And that's one spot. Of course, it wasn't as going to be as grand in other parts of the country. But you see, and now, of course, that is much, it gives you the impression that Castle Clinton is much. Uh, bigger than, than it is, but uh, that's the idea of how the theater looked. 
exaggerated. And there's her photograph, and there she is again. And there's P.T. Barnum, and uh, she is uh, again as well. Remember, he also made a, 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 a lot of money with his American Museum in, 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 I believe it was on Fifth Avenue in New York. And that's where you, uh, where the word, uh, uh, where the story goes that people went to visit that museum with all of the exhibits of strange individuals and interesting animals, et cetera. And, and if you will use the word, I guess, freaks today, which is not politically correct. And also, and people didn't want to leave. So uh, uh, he put up a sign said, this way to the egress. People thought it was another animal. <laughs> and when you went through that door, you found yourself on the outside. Uh, so egress, I guess, could be added up there with Jumbo, the elephant, which he was responsible for uh, bringing here as well. Uh, so Clinton, again, in the 1840s and 50s, now I bring this up because I was responsible for this group. I brought uh, 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 Zoe's, uh, Zoe Vandermeer here. She uh, uh, is a fabulous singer and she was very much enthralled with Jenny Lynn and she wanted to actually sing where she did. So uh, we set this up and had her sing there one evening uh, in Castle Clinton as uh, an entertainment event as well. And there again, is the, that's the poster for it. And here's a nice colored picture of the uh, structure when it was a theater and she's singing. And we'll go quite a bit of ways because 1855, uh, there were plenty of theaters in Manhattan. Uh, there were plenty of the exhibit areas so you can go and, 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 uh, and galleries, et cetera and entertainment that you can involve yourself in. Uh, and Castle Clinton was losing money. It was no longer popular. Uh, Castle Garden, excuse me, because that name had been changed to Castle Garden. So it came immigration center. Now I'm not gonna spend any time on this because we're gonna be doing Ellis Island and that's when I'm going to probably be comparing the two. But I believe about, uh, Seven or eight million people came uh, through Castle Garden uh, from 1855 to 1890. Uh, and that's when the federal government took over immigration and was to build Ellis Island in the 1890s. But many of the uh, things, ideas for Ellis Island came from Castle Clinton, uh, Cas excuse me, Castle Garden. And you could see there was a labor exchange uh, there was a money exchange there. Uh, Wards Island was where they brought the immigrants who were ill uh, 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 to wait for the, for the sickness was finished to, to be able to continue on their way. And, and so we'll, we'll be talking about some of that when we talk about Ellis Island. Now, the immigration center uh, was uh, a recruiting uh, center for the Civil War and the Civil War uh, officer, the two Civil War officers are on the left of my old supervisor there, Jimmy Cleckley. And um, uh, so, and then the other uniforms, of course, are from the War of 1812. But it was for recruiting. You got off uh, the boat, you were an immigrant, and you could uh, join the army uh, to help fight uh, the rebels in the Civil War. And uh, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say because they look so terrible, but the guy on the right <laughs> with uh, looks worse for wear is me. That was towards the end of my career. So I'll have to apologize if I look a bit worn. Anyway, so there we are uh, uh, all together there uh, having our picture taken. And another view of Castle Garden as an immigration center. And you see the recruitments going up on the left there. <laughs> So, uh, and the labor exchange. Now, remember, most of the uh, immigrants coming at the time were from Northern Europe, especially Germans, uh, Irish as well, and because of the potato famine. Uh, so when uh, Ellis Island came along, it was going to be a different group of people who were the majority, Eastern Europeans, Southern Europeans, et cetera. 
some views of uh, boat travel at the time. And uh, you could see how the uh, steerage, third class uh, immigrants uh, uh, were fed. And of course, the upper class people often on the same boats. So, uh, so interestingly enough, it's a different situation there. And coming into uh, New York, probably in the 1860s or 70s, and just a few pictures of the trip would, would be pretty rough. And here we have uh, uh, another one, which is much calmer as we're coming into the harbor. And immigrants coming into Castle Garden again. Now, they landed at Ward's Island and then they were put on boats to be brought over to uh, Castle Garden. So this is what's happening here. This is some of the immigrants of the latter part of the 19th century as well. And this, of course, uh, got a lot of people in Manhattan upset because all of these masses of immigrants were landing in Battery in Battery Park area. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of, uh, shall we say, uh, friction uh, at times. Interestingly enough, that one of the reasons that this immigration center was set up uh, was because when immigrants were getting off the boat, there was no process at all before the 18, 1855 or very skimpy, and they were being taken advantage of. Literally, as they uh, landed in Manhattan, someone would come along and grab their bags and start running up the road. Sometimes they even grab their kids. Immigrants could go running after them, and they would find themselves exhausted at a boarding house, which that's exactly what uh, had happened. These gentlemen were getting business and, and hired to bring them here one way or another. And so uh, the outrageous rates they charge and uh, often stealing luggage, what have you. So this was one of the reasons that a system was set up where you had to have a license uh, to be able to have the immigrants stay in your establishment. And I brought this, showed this one on the left. We see the processing uh, getting off the, uh, the boat uh, from Ward's Island. And then we see some Asians uh, here, I believe. And uh, let's see. Uh, and just bringing up the idea of the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which you can not come anymore after a certain period, I believe it was the 1880s, uh, to the United States as an immigrant. Obviously, there was some kind of railroad or L or what have you uh, right at the end of Battery Park. This is the 1880s again, I believe. And you see Castle Gardens through uh, the bridge there with the locomotive on the top. Uh, I won't get into that. Some of the conflict between uh, labor that was here and the labor that was coming from overseas. Another view of the ferry boat here. And then here is a rather uh, attractive view of, uh, of Battery Park in the same period. So Castle Clinton right up there would have been loaded with a great deal of immigrants being processed. And that's still a very romantic view of uh, uh, Castle Garden. And this, uh, the Land of Promises by the artist Ulrich and that they are right there in Castle Clinton waiting to be processed. And here is some of the, probably one of the labor exchanges and other uh, offices, uh, money exchanges, et cetera, who, who, who help immigrants uh, have a more easy process of landing. After a while, there was to be a lot of corruption and they couldn't handle the huge amounts of immigrants that were coming towards the latter part of the 1880s and 1890s. And of course, there is, uh, as an immigration center, in the same, under the same little dome area, you see that up on the top there as well, where Jenny Lynn sang in 1850. I brought this up because uh, I, it said in the uh, reading there that uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, grandfather uh, in 1885, either grandfather or great-grandfather, was one of the immigrants from Germany. And this says line 33. Well, I looked at this uh, with a fine-tuned comb and I couldn't find his name. But anyway, this is what they would do. You would uh, be checked off here as you went through the process. 
And this is a wonderful picture. It had to be after 1883 because there you see the Brooklyn Bridge. I love this picture. You see Castle Clinton in the foreground. Of course, uh, basically the island is long gone and that had happened a long time ago. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is uh, still an immigration center, but now we're coming into another era. era. This, after the end of it being an immigration center, it became the first aquarium in the United States. So here we have again, the interior of Castle Clinton and you see there are, it looks like sword ship, a uh, swordfish, uh, whales, uh, uh, I see uh, tortoises, up, tortoises up there. Oh uh, yeah, great big whale in there, etc. cetera. So uh, <laughs> again, it gives you the impression of being much larger than it was. There is a photograph of it as an aquarium and it was quite a famous one. And they wrote uh, the, the uh, scientists who worked there uh, published many papers on um, uh, marine white life and the type of fish, et cetera. And so it was quite a place and it remained in existence, I believe until 1940 when Robert Moses tore it down and uh, uh, wanted to uh, use that area as a, a, a intersection or whatever in one of the tunnels he was building. Uh, but the federal government stepped in. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt had a lot to do with saving the structure uh, when after, after it was almost, almost pretty much gutted, et cetera. These are some of the gentlemen that worked there at the time, a very nice colored uh, postcard of the interior, as well as uh, uh, one of the, that looks like one of the tortoises uh, or one of the big sea turtles, excuse me, not tortoise. And there you go. And that's it again as a uh, aquarium in the 18, looks like early 1900s. You can tell by the ladies' clothes in the foreground and even further along. So this is an aquarium. And that was an aquarium till what was it? 1898 until 1940. Of course, this is what Robert Moses did. And that all had to be uh, renovated after the fact. And uh, there is Castle Clinton, a fairly recent picture, I believe. There's the, the old uh, uh, wharf there, which was used also for, uh, uh, for boats as well. And that's it. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to ask, answer them. Sure. Um, we have a question here. Where did the immigrants come in prior to 1855 or that's, prior to the Castle Garden? As far as I understand it, they just landed anywhere that they, they had docks <laughs> that would uh, uh, service the boats. I don't think they stopped at Ward Island, et cetera. So they were, it was pretty much a, a chaotic situation. When that was happening, uh, uh, lots of, uh, like I say, corruption was going on. They were taking advantage of uh, people who didn't speak English. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the I was gonna say tavern cake keepers, but the, um, the, uh, uh, the hotels or whatever that, that were uh, uh, boarding houses, excuse me, that did all kinds of shenanigans to get their business. And then of course you were coming with uh, different uh, monies. So there was no exchange to, uh, uh, to uh, transfer it to American money. And of course, there were many people who cheated you, who did it, who would come up to you and say, oh, I could change that money or whatever it is. So uh, the, the overwhelming amount of immigrants that were coming uh, and how that the, the battery became pretty much chaotic and, uh, and uh, so it was done to make it an orderly process. And there were, there were uh, 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 immigrant groups already here, uh, Germans, uh, Irish groups that would come down uh, and they were uh, 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 allowed to uh, work with the immigrants once Castle uh, Garden was an immigration center. 
and they would try to uh, to uh, give them a voice on uh, making sure they weren't cheated and ha help them to get lodging, help them uh, uh, if they wanted to leave New York. And of course, there was a ticket office in the in the New Castle Garden as well. So they were order making an orderly as much as possible system to from a chaotic one. And that's the basic. Uh, and most of the immigrants were coming through New York. That was a the biggest harbor in the United States, really an international harbor. Uh, and so this is where they came for the most part, though they did come in through other ports as well. Does the current uh, Castle Clinton have a roof? Uh, in the earlier pictures, it seems like it has a roof. And the modern pictures, it feels like it doesn't have a roof. Okay, that, that, that roof was put on, uh, I believe in the 1820s or, what, or it started to be roofed then. And by the time that Jenny Lynn, Lynn, uh, Jenny Lynn came in 1850, that was uh, now a theater uh, uh, where concerts and, and uh, I don't know if they did full blown operas, I don't think so, uh, but uh, it was used for uh, uh, events like Jenny Lynn coming to uh, to uh, for her tour. She was an international star. Interestingly enough, we often think that we're we're we're, we're the only people who know international uh, stars and events, et cetera. 19th century had a lot of uh, of uh, new technology that, that developed transportation, as we talked about before, railroads, steamships, et cetera. So uh, she, when she came, uh, you would, she would come here most likely on a steamship of some form or another and, uh, and travel by uh, railroad to get and to do her tour. Uh, so uh, uh, the roof was taken off after uh, it uh, was uh, being uh, demolished by Robert Moses. And so it had a roof all the way through uh, from the 1820s, I believe, uh, all the way through the aquarium. Uh, and you saw that that three-story structure at the entrance that was added as part of the, uh, the exhibit areas and administrative offices for the aquarium as well. So the roof had been taken off when the inside was gutted by Robert Moses. So it had a roof for much of its history but it was not built with one originally. Okay, I think that wraps it up as far as questions. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone for attending this afternoon's programming event and I hope you enjoyed Alan's presentation of Castle Clinton. Thank you again for watching and stay tuned for next week's program with Alan, which will be about Ellis Island and immigration in the later 19th century. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.